Okay, well, um, I, I think uh, we could uh, we could start the, the second part. Um, um, so I will uh, I will uh, um, sort of, uh, resume the recording in a, in a, in a moment. Uh, just to say, Mangala, that uh, Elizabeth has um, entered a comment slash question for you in the uh, chat. Mm -hmm. You might be able to to see it. So just to make you aware of that. Oh um, yeah, I can see it. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, for for the final bit of the question session and and, and the answer session. Uh, wonderful. So let's resume the recording. Okay, I think we're back um, after the break. I hope everyone's had a, um, a refreshing uh, ten minutes. Um, I'm delighted now to. Uh, uh, to have a second speaker, uh, Dr. Ed Kessler, um, uh, MBE, uh, something that I failed to mention in his introduction, and I do apologize. Um, Ed was awarded an MBE for services um, to interfaith relations in 2011, uh, a very uh, worthy indeed um, commendation to him. Um, the title of Ed's contribution uh, this, this evening is uh, The Changing Landscape of Religion and Belief standing at the crossroads. Ed, thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, Dragos. And before I, 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 I try the, the dangerous task of sharing my screen, uh, I want to say uh, the, a few words of thanks to everybody at IOX, because the Wolf Institute and IOX go a very long way back, for those of you who don't know, um, with uh, Father John Gillians from the very beginning, uh, who established IOX a year after we were created, uh, and all the various uh, directors through to Dragos. Um, uh, I feel privileged to be part of this conversation. Uh, and also, I would like to share with you that um, uh, one of the great scholars who um, influenced me in my own PhD is Sebastian Brock, uh, who his name appears here. I don't know whether he is there, but, uh, uh, but I just want to say a thank you to um, Professor Brock for his work on Syriac Christianity, which uh, influenced my own work on the church fathers and the rabbis. Uh, but with no further ado, um, let's have a go. Uh, and um, if it doesn't work, uh, I, I will come straight back. Um, so hopefully uh, you should be able to see the slides um, and I shall um, do the slideshow, uh, play from the start. Great. Um, so uh, Father Dragos, just, just say you can see it or put out your thumb to say that you can see it. Thank you. Thank you. I can see it. I can see it. <laughs> so um, it's my, con my, my uh, conversation with you is slightly different from Mangala um, in that I'm going to lay out what's going on in terms of religion and belief at the moment, um, not just in the UK, but around the world. And you've got that quote um, standing at the crossroads and that came from a letter. It's not my own. It's a letter I received a couple of years ago um, from um, a person who said we are standing at a crossroads. What kind of society? do we want? Will we be tribal and separate from one, one another or an integrated, inclusive, welcoming society? So that's the question that was raised of me and I raise it of you. Um, because the world changed dramatically up until the 18th century age of enlightenment, religious minorities define themselves in terms of their shared values, laws and beliefs. If and when they had to move, they would take their laws, values and beliefs with them. In other words, it wasn't so much territory that defined their identity, but a way of life, a role played by religion. Now, the Enlightenment um, planted the seeds of the nation state, of nationalism, of privileging territory, um, and often a single language. But as well as doing that, it challenged some of the assumptions of religion and the, polit the political role of the church. So Enlightenment notions about equality, as well as nationhood, came to the fore. Politicians wanted to create a unified state populated by one people or ethnos and they hoped that by removing legal, legal restrictions they would promote assimilation and that minorities like my own, the Jewish people, would disappear into that nation with a single identity with a shared narrative. Of course it's not turned out that way and I'd like to raise over uh, the next 15 or so minutes 
to what extent we've, explored, we've, we've taken into account the implications that in most parts of the world, the most powerful actors in civil society are religious. So let me set the scene. If you want to find your figures on religion and belief, then the Pew Research Center in the United States is probably the most eminent and most trustworthy uh, of sources. And according to this survey, 84% of the world's population uh, identified themselves as belonging to a specific religion. I mean, it's an astonishing number when we live in the UK in such a secular society, but 84% identify with one religion or another, which shows that religion is a key driving force in the world today. And what this means is that the traditional model of the relationship between religion and society, what's called the secularization thesis, which suggests that as society modernizes, it becomes more secular. Recent history shows otherwise. There you are in China. There are more members of the Communist Party than members uh, that more Christians. I'm sorry, um, Chinese Christians than members of the Communist Party. Um, and the two largest religions in the world are growing, dramatically so. Christianity, one point, uh, at, uh, at the figures there, at 2.3 billion in 2019, expected to rise to 2.7 billion. Significant numbers of, of growth amongst evangelicals and Protest um, the Protestant community who have grown tenfold from 1970 through to the present day. And of course, the Orthodox churches, I believe, and, and it's around three. And because the Orthodox churches are as divided as my own community. I thought Jews were divided until I, I made friends with Orthodox Christians and realized your own community is equally divided. But I do believe you're more than 300 around the world, a million, that is. <laughs> Whereas my own community, the Jewish community, is about 15 million, a small community. Nevertheless, Christianity is continuing to grow. Uh, but not as fast as the Muslim population, which is, is expected to rise uh, by the end of uh, this decade, 2030, to about 2.2 billion. That's 26% of the world's total projected population of 8.3 billion. So Islam is growing faster than Christianity. And one of the reasons, or a number of reasons, is that it's a, a younger um, population, has a higher fertility rate, um, and, and because of improved health and economic conditions in Muslim majority countries and the decline in child mortality, the growth is higher than the Christians. Now, one of the implications of this change, and Mangler has, has mentioned, in fact, in, 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 during the break, we talked a little bit about the pressure on Christian communities in India. But there we have it. In India, there are 32 million Christians alongside nearly 200 million Muslims, alongside nearly a billion Hindus. In Indonesia, 24 million Christians in the largest Muslim country in the world. The largest population in the world is not in the Middle East, it's in Indonesia, followed by uh, India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Um, so these Muslim communities uh, are significant in other parts of the world than the Middle East. And there in Nigeria, you have more or less the same number of Christians and Muslims. My friends, it's not by chance that in these areas, religiously motivated conflict has increased. Tension and conflict are not restricted to encounters between Christians and Muslims. Uh, in China, um, the terrible treatment of the Uyghurs, which is becoming clearer and clearer uh, as time passes. Terrible treatment of the followers of the Dalai Lama in Tibet. And in Israel, I mean, if ever you're going to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem, it is at, at this very moment um, where the struggle um, in intercommunal fighting that's beginning, the signs are beginning to um, show themselves is of great concern to all of us, not, not just to choose. But in Israel proper, and I'm not talking about West Bank or Gaza or occupied territory, nearly 23% of the population is due to, is expected to be Muslim by the end of this decade, which is a significant increase from 14% in 1990. And there you have the Israel population uh, as, um, as of last year. Um, in terms of Christians in Israel, for those of you who've been to the Holy Land, um, the largest uh, Christian population uh, is, um, uh, the, it, it is um, 
Russian uh, and Greek Orthodox churches, go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, there are four main Christian groups that, 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 that dominate it, the, the Russians, the Armenians, the Latins, that is the Catholics, uh, and, the, and the Greeks. About 200,000 Christians in Israel. If we get close, move closer to home, at least geographically, we'll look what's happening in Europe. Although Christians will continue to be the largest religious group, the Christian population in Europe is likely to decline by about 100 million by 2050. The Jewish community will remain very small at about one to one and a half million. Uh, Muslim community will increase, uh, but still is going, only going to be about 10%. The largest growth you'll see there and the largest number are those are defined as unaffiliated, uh, those who are the nuns, as the sociologists of religion call them, those who are not affiliated with one religion or another. Now, they're not all uh, necessarily atheists, indeed not. Many are agnostic, um, but are not institutionally affiliated. And it seems to me there's significant challenges to all religious institutions, including your own, about how to reach and those people who do not have any affiliation. Specifically in the UK, if we take the UK as an example, the Christian population has declined from 71% to 59% to 2011. And the increase in the number of nuns has jumped, almost doubled to 25% uh, just in the last 15 years. Um, there's a real challenge for the church uh, but of course, it's not the church as a whole. We're talking about, in that case, the decline of the mainstream churches, the Church of England, the Roman Catholic Church. The Orthodox churches in the UK have grown, but still very small, but partly through the um, immigration um, from Eastern Europe. Um, the Pentecostal churches are also growing quite significantly between, I think, 2005 and 2012. 700 new black churches were established just in London alone. Um, one of the big differences is not just the increase in the nuns, the no religion, or the decrease in the number of mainstream Christians, but the increase in diversity in Britain. Fifty years ago, the only major non-Christian grouping in this country were Jews uh, at around 300,000. Um, and that was about one in 150 people. Today, minorities make up one in 10 people in the United Kingdom. Um, and Jews are fourth after Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs. So there's a real shift in the religion and belief landscape. What does that mean? Well, the first thing I think is to accept the fact that religious monopolies are in decline. Christianity can no longer be portrayed as the dominant host religion in Europe. And a previously intrinsic relationship is being weakened. In other words, it seems to me that belonging to a minority, whether one's a Christian or a Jew, is the norm. The Church of England does not hold the authority it once did. Its privileged position as the established church remains. There are 26 bishops, as you probably know, who sit in the House of Lords simply because of their, um, their, their role in the church. London, Durham, um, York, um, Canterbury, Salisbury, and so on. Um, but what we're finding is that the church, as I mentioned, is becoming increasingly pluralist within the church itself. Um, so the second thing is the UK, or I've given you a couple of points there. Another uh, point I want to show the U that is that the UK is now a community, not just pluralist, but a community whose minority communities or non-Christian communities have grown not just in terms of number, but in terms of confidence. More than one generation of Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs um, have grown up knowing no other home than the UK, than Britain. Jews returned to Britain in 1656 under Cromwell, so it's slightly different, but these minority communities do not view themselves as outsiders. They are full Brits. So what does that mean in terms of the Church of England? You have this remarkable quote from Queen Elizabeth II at Lambeth Palace in 2012, 
um, when she articulated what she considers, and they've got to remember, of course, that the Queen is the head of the Church of England. She's the head of the Church of Scotland when she goes to uh, crosses. I was about to say the border. It's not a border at the moment. There is no Republic of Scotland yet. But nevertheless, when she crosses into Scotland, she becomes, uh, as it were, um, Presbyterian. And, and what I won't read out the quote there. It is in front of you. But isn't it remarkable? that one of the shifts in the last 50 years is that the Church of England now sees itself as a, an umbrella body for all faith communities, different communities, different denominations of the, of, of the church, your own, uh, as well as the Roman Catholic Church, uh, but also other faith communities. Um, so British society is now three-dimensional. One, there is the historic Christian tradition and culture an increasing number of people who might define themselves as cultural Christians. Two, an increasing influence of non-religious worldviews and beliefs, humanists, secular, and so on. And three, religious pluralism reinforced by aspects of globalization. Now, last year at the Wolf Institute undertook the largest ever survey of diversity in the UK. We interviewed, or oh, I say UK, it's England and the Wales, uh, forgive me, any Scots listening. We, we and, uh, and Northern Ireland for that matter, we interviewed over 11,000 adults to ask questions about their attitudes towards religion, ethnicity, and nationality. We read all the time about how polarized our society has become how divided that has become. Government has invested and intervened with social cohesion policies. And so what we wanted to do was to actually see what was happening, not just what the government was saying or what we're reading in the media. And our analysis is not institutional. We were interested in interpersonal relations. What did you personally think? about those three aspects of diversity. We wanted to uncover what divides and what unites us, tap going down to local authority level. Um, and this is the most recent and the most thorough uh, study of diversity in the UK that ever, that ever uh, that, you see I'm stuttering, I'm so excited, that has ever been undertaken. So let's share the good news with you. And this is 2020, my friends, it's very, very recent information. First of all, there is a national consensus that diversity is good for British society. In other words, that we get along. So um, there were no differences between white and Asian respondents who answered the question whether ethnic diversity is good for Britain. More than three to one agreed to, more than three to one agreed and those who disagreed. That, that's a very strong positive finding um, who said that ethnic diversity was good for Britain. We then asked the question about immigration. Were migrants good for British society? And again, more than two to one agreed that migrants are good for British society. At a time when we're hearing about the challenges of immigration, the fears of immigration, when we have a home office um, minister, Priti Patel, who wants to kind of send these people away, fundamentally, and I'm a child of migrants. My, both my parents were born in Vienna and came as re Jewish refugees. And I'm sure many of the people watching this, if not themselves come from another country, our um, uh, uh, parents may come from another country. What's so encouraging is that more than two to one agree that migrants is good for British society. Now, what's so interesting and a bit depressing, my friends, is that religious diversity is the lowest. Now, whilst, 41% agree it's positive, um, nearly two to one against those who disagree. You can see it's at the bottom of those three. We seem as a country least comfortable with religion in comparison with ethnicity and in comparison with um, uh, nationality. So we wanted to dig down further and ask ourselves, ask, well, what, what's going on in that concern about religion? And what we did is we asked this question, how would you feel if a, a, a person very close to you, a sibling or a, a, someone, a very good friend, how would you feel if they married somebody else? It's, it's, it's a common social science question. So we would ask people of, in terms of the ethnic question, how would you feel if you married a black person, if they were white people? If you're a black person, how would you feel if, if a loved one married a white person and so on? 
Uh, and we did that with ethnicity, we did it with nationality, and we did it with religion. And I'm going to share this with you. Okay, the green is a very positive image. So what we found in terms of attitudes towards, um, we asked people who were not black, how would you feel if a loved one married a black person? More than 74% were comfortable with that. Now, when, I don't know about you, but I was brought up in a time when there was a lot of color prejudice. But when you look at that, that pretty much the whole of England and Wales, the green, the darker the green, the better if you like, but it's all pretty much green, a few spots here and there. But 74% of the country were comfortable with a close relative marrying an Asian or black person. And we only asked people who were not Asian or black. So then we move to the, uh, sorry, there's the Asian 70%. Uh, black, 74%, Asian, 70%. And by Asian, we weren't including Chinese. We were talking about the subcontinent and, 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 and that geography. There are little pockets of lighter colors, which were a concern a little bit in the Northwest, in the Midlands, around Birmingham. But for the most part, that's a very positive story. Now, when we ask the question to people who are not Muslim, how do you feel about marrying a Muslim? This is what we got. Yeah, a shocking image where we have less than half the people we interviewed and asked who are not Muslim, how would, you feel, how would you feel about a close relative marrying a Muslim? Only 44% said they were comfortable. What's so interesting is that the word Muslim appears to trigger a more negative sentiment than the word Pakistani, even though 98% of Pakistanis are Muslim. So we find that it's the religion and the challenge we have for those of us of faith, it's the religion that is triggering these negative attitudes. Now those pockets of green that you can see before you uh, are in areas such as London, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, Bristol, Brighton, uh, and parts of the Northwest. But it's not a very comfortable, um, not very comfortable viewing. Um, what we did also notice is that the younger population, there was a, 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 a more tolerant attitude than an older population. Um, and British Muslim women in particular um, were showing a shift in attitudes towards others. So where does that leave us? I have to draw it to a close, otherwise there won't be, oh my goodness, well, time is moving on. Let me, let me uh, run through three tasks I believe we have in terms of fostering um, better understanding in our society. The first is religion and belief literacy. Uh, there's a typical Mark Twain quote um, uh, in terms of the challenge, um, people, the ignorance that we face. And I'm sure all of us who are out there in society, whether we're teaching in, in, uh, in universities or going into schools, recognize that there's increasing illiteracy of religion and belief. Um, and we need to know more, we know who we need to learn how, who to trust, if you like. Um, uh, politicians not only need advisors on the economy, they need advisors on the religion and belief landscape. The second is we need to know, and Mangala touched on this in her brilliant presentation, what works and what doesn't work in terms of interfaith dialogue. It's not just a matter of wonderful Archbishop Gregorius, who's such a, 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 a He's no longer the head of the Greek Orthodox Church, and I can't remember who he's remembered. Nikitas. Nikitas, exactly. It's not simply having a photograph of Archbishop Nikitas with the chief rabbi or the Grand Mufti. We, we need to work from the ground up, and that seems to have more of an impact than um, just the religious leaders. God bless them, uh, meeting. Um, so uh, dialogue seems to work on the ground, and I don't have time uh, now to give you some examples, but if you ask, uh, I'll be happy to share. The third is developing local networks. That's what the COVID has done. It's brought together faith communities to work together, um, to collaborate. Uh, the homeless uh, situation has brought together churches and synagogue in Cambridge, for example, to provide a homeless shelter. The terrible Grenfell fire, um, when the local civic society, the council couldn't cope, it was the church and the mosque that provided food, shelter and sustenance. Um, and so the third task, it seems to me, is developing local networks. And fourth, and this will appeal, I think, to you all and to Mangler in the way she was talking, which is this, that it's not just about what we've got in common. We start there. We Jews and Christians start from what we share in common. We share the same scriptures, more or less. I mean, the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament is more or less the same. 
Um, the order is slightly different, and there's some discussion about bits and pieces of the book, but it's more or less the same. Jesus was a Jew. We share that in common, but that's not enough. We have to work out how to deal with, with difference um, and work out that way of living together whilst remaining different. I suppose from a Jewish point of view, I'd say that I, I look to, uh, to my Christian brothers and sisters to um, uh, Kiddush Hashem, to sanctify God's name. And, and I, I wonder whether you might look to me as your Jewish brother and, sis, uh, brother, uh, and, and, and Jewish sisters to help bring the kingdom of God on earth. Um, it, it is some real dealing with difference as well as together. So there are a few signposts. Yes, we stand at the crossroads. Yes, there's a changing religion and belief landscape. Um, uh, and there's a fragmented, fragmented and multifaceted nation state. But understanding the religious makeup and its role in motivating society is no longer an optional extra. It is, my friends, essential. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much indeed uh, for such an eye-opener of, of a presentation uh, and such an engaging, um, engaging uh, prospect that you brought uh, to, to us all. Um, well, I, I, before allowing Mangala for, uh, to, to offer her response, I just want to say that uh, if, if the choice is to be standing at the crossroads with people like you and people uh, sort of uh, of the same mind, I think it's not a bad prospect if, if it makes the crossroads less of a confusing and less of a tangled place. And hopefully it, it helps, you know, people um, move forward uh, more meaningfully and more um, connected. So uh, again, thank you for all the work that you do at the Wolf Institute and, and for your presentation this evening, which, which stems and is rooted in that work, both of, of, of yourself and of uh, all of your colleagues there. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mangala, um, if you'd like to offer a brief response. Uh, just a brief response and let people ask their questions and have a discussion. Thank you, thank you very much, Ed. I have a total, I'm an airhead when it comes to statistics and whatever, but your presentation was so brilliant, I could actually take it in and feel really encouraged by the statistics. And also to open up local initiatives, which, uh, it's happening now because of this crisis and, and, and whenever one hears the negative side, it's good to know the positives that are happening at the same time. And I, I, I can only say, apropos of the crossroads, uh, you set me thinking about once I was in one of these, the inter-churches -church together gathering and lots of people and there were subgroups just talking and someone said, it's often said we all believe in the same God. Let's talk about it. There was absolute hush silence in the room of 20 people. No one dared to say anything. And then the Armenian Archbishop was there. He said, we are all God's children. We may not talk to him in the same way, <laughs> which broke the ice. <laughs> and, and I personally uh, feel that the crossroads allow us to do that, to, to, to actually turn it into something positive. Once we, once we are on the theistic ground in the sense of God in, in whatever way you understand, then it's exciting to have these ground level conversations. And, and I personally, I feel scholars and academics get a bad bashing a lot of the time, but their work is needed to, absolutely needed for the kind of work you're outlining. We do wish we had more proper advices to the government instead of stamping their foot like an elephant in a you know, famous China shop uh, when they don't know what they're doing. And uh, then of course, pronouncing, jumping to conclusions without even considering facts. And this goes on all the time. So I wish, I wish really there were more channels open as you do. Anyway, let me leave the scene and um, take questions for. Uh... Okay, um, thank you very much, Mangala, for your for your um, response to to Ed, and again for um, pushing our, our conversation forward this evening. Um, um, I would would like to um, ask you, Mangala, actually, to take up um, the question that was in the chat. Um, um, Ed, oh yes, uh, but, uh, 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 but but before you do that. Uh, preempting, I mean, uh, some of the questions that I, I, I'm, I'm sure are bound to, um, 
to populate the chat. Um, I would like to um, address a question to add to keep in mind for 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 uh, after uh, your answer, Mangala. And the question that I had was, um, how do we deal with this kind of loss of privilege um, attitude that is prevailing in, in in society in some communities, particularly um, both in terms of, of the shift that we see in the religious. Uh, um, 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 field, but also in terms of um, values in society and, and the sort of this shifting of patterns, uh, this change of paradigm, because I think this is also part of the crisis of dialogue and part of the crisis of resistance and, and, and hardening of attitudes. So um, uh, this was something that came to mind as, as you were speaking, Ed. Um, now over to you, Mangala, again. Um, uh, re so the question that um, Dr. Elizabeth Elkritov, um, also one of, of the Institute's um, lecturers, um, uh, and also trustees um, uh, placed in the chat um, uh, during yes, the Yes, I've just read it. It concerns reincarnation. I'll try and keep it brief. Uh, to be honest, I, I do deal with it in the book, but that's a cheap answer. But the, the whole idea of reincarnation means, uh, it's not even right to call it reincarnation. It's really rebirth, um, taking a new body for the soul. Now this kind of uh, belief is has no place in the christian thinking because we think, think in terms of a human being as an integral person soul and body and the this biogenesis uh, means that it's not integral it's something separable and could be put in a different form as for the so uh, rebirth has a different meaning in the christian as you know baptism is rebirth in as kind of a spiritual regeneration it is, does not mean uh, literally getting another body and uh, christ's answer to nicodemus also elaborates on this as for the people having experiences and a lot of research has been done i would say to be honest that they are claimed but i wouldn't say they were ever convincingly proved and there is a lot of evidence on the other hand on psychic uh, psychological kind of reading backwards and projections and psychic i mean in india sometimes people who came up with these stories were exorcised even among in the hindus let alone christians you know if they came up with stories that sounded like they all that they were suspicious you're possessed by some spirit got to be got rid of was the attitude not necessarily believing it some, of course, believed it, especially the religious figures. I, I would say, I would agree with the bishop that I'm not sure whether he would, he would say they have no such experiences, but it certainly would not figure anywhere in the Christian system whatsoever for the very reason that we have completely different ideas of what salvation means. And uh, it's not that kind of rebirth. Even there, it's getting out of the births, which is the goal, not being born again even if it's a good life. Yeah. Thank you, Mangala. Um, Dragos, in terms of your question about the response to loss of pri privilege, I, I, I'd say three things. One, um, we all have to work a bit harder, those of us of faith. Um, and our religious institutions um, have in some places failed us um, and failed their own community. Um, and for those of us of faith, we have to be honest and accept that that has happened um, and where we have failed in one's own community and I look at my own um, there is a an imperative to be honest about the failings in my case of Jewish religious nationalist extremism I have to acknowledge it exists as much as I don't want to it's there um, and uh, we need to work harder um, we need to acknowledge our failures the second is the increase in the number of nuns means there are people without a home this is a massive opportunity um, um, and I, I think that um, faith has so much to offer of all different colors and types. And there are so many people who would benefit from um, the witness and the mission of my Christian brothers and sisters, as well as my Muslim brothers and sisters. Um, there's a real opportunity, I think, for a rebirth, if you like. Um, um, and the third is in a time of hardening of attitudes in a time when media transfers communication from one place to another immediately from the streets of Jerusalem immediately to the streets of London um, where you come across my friends instances of hatred particularly religious hatred I ask no less that you stand up 
and you have the courage to speak out. In my uh, 23 years of running the Wolf Institute, uh, there's numerous occasions I've had to stand up and speak out, whether it's Islamophobic, whether it's anti-Christian, or whether it's anti-Semitic. Now, of course, I'm going to stand up about anti-Semitism, you say, because I'm a Jew. But I'm not as effective as you would be standing up against anti-Semitism. And I promise you, I'm far more effective standing up against anti-Christian hatred because I'm not a Christian. Mm. And together, we are effective standing up against anti-Muslim hatred because we are not Muslims. We live in a time where we have to have the courage and in the teaching, uh, particularly those of us in the Federation and beyond, teaching our students to have the courage, not only to care, uh, but the courage to stand up. And, and I think that is vital in this, this, this loss of privilege and this um, attitude that exists out there, Dragos. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> well, um, I think we have uh, between maybe five and 10 minutes and, and not to not to push too much um, the uh, the limits of the time that we uh, we allocated for this evening. So for questions. Um, so um, if, if anyone uh, from the audience has a question or a, a comment, um, uh, feel free to um, raise your hand or, or type it in the chat uh, with the very important caveat that um, that keep your questions to the point uh, or or any uh, um, sort of um, background to the question uh, as, as, um, as, again, to the point as possible. So we, uh, we allow people, um, uh, our speakers to, to actually reply um, to, to your question. Um, so, um, as I said, depending on the number of, of questions, we can, we can spend five or 10 minutes. Um, um, so uh, anyone who has a question, feel free to ask uh, now. Um, um, I, I, would, I mean, I take it as a good sign in a sense. I think there's a lot to take in. The fact that that uh, there isn't um, uh, sort of um, a barrage of questions uh, coming our way, but uh, um, there is a raised hand. There is a raised hand. I'm sorry. Yes, um, um, I, I can't uh, readily translate your name, Father. Um, if you would uh, unmute yourself. Um, Jovan, I'm not father, but thank you, father. Uh, my question is to Ed, and uh, Ed, can you hear me? I, I put this to you, please, please, uh, and everyone, do not take this to be provocative. I don't mean it in this sense, but when you showed the graphs and uh, expressed the disappointment about uh, people's expressions in regard to um, uh, perhaps sensing some disappointment or concern about... Uh, members of the family marrying Muslims. Um, uh, do we necessarily need to see that as such a disappointing thing? And I mean that thinking almost sort of looking back to the chart you showed before that, because on the one hand, people were not expressing any, any uh, signs of racism towards people from other countries. And, and, and so, you know, a person might think, well, I'm quite happy to have someone marry someone from India if they're a Christian, but I would have some sense of reservation if the person's perhaps a Muslim, just because of the difficulties of family religion and, and issues with grandchildren and so on. So that's my question. Need we see that so negatively? Is that a, such a bad sign? Thank you. Thank you, Joban. And I think Elizabeth had the same sort of question in the chat. Um, the reason, and, and of course, time didn't allow me to go through it. The, re the reason why it's a concern is that obviously you, I'm sure, would prefer that your children, if you had them or your loved one, married people from within your own faith, uh, as would I. Uh, I. I would prefer my children to marry someone who was Jewish. Um, but actually, uh, the attitude towards Muslims was more negative than any other community. So, for example, you'd expect it to be the same if you're a Christian, uh, you'd expect it to have the same sort of attitude if a loved one was going to be marrying a Jew or a Hindu or a Sikh or a Muslim. You'd expect, expect it to be consistent. Um, what we find in the, um, uh, in, in the survey was the attitude towards Muslims was much worse than the attitudes towards other 
faith, other religious communities. Um, I didn't have an opportunity to present all, all the information, but that's what made it so disturbing. Now, you may say that's not such a surprise because of the association of the media and terrorism and radicalism and Islamism and so on. Um, uh, but nevertheless, um, it, it, it's, it's a major worry if religion is the lowest of those three in terms of the benefits of British society, lower than ethnicity and lower religion as a whole, not any one religion, and lower than nationality. So there is a, there is a in British society, this is father, not uh, Yoban, not a father, but the Yoban, in British society, um, and we haven't been able to do it elsewhere. But I suspect the situation in France, for example, um, would not be so very different. Um, with the challenges over that they have at the moment with laicity. Um, so that, that, that was why, and I hope that answers uh, Elizabeth's question as well. Thank you very much, both for the question, very important question, and, and for, um, to Elizabeth as well, and, and obviously to add for, for, um, for your answer. Um, just making sure that um, if there's anyone else wanting to, um, to, uh, to raise a question, um, we have time for this. Um, Okay, Philip, I think you, you have your physical hand up, which is wonderful. Um, um, so um, I so think you can, you can ask questions. Th thank you very much. I, I couldn't find my electronic hand, I apologize. <laughs> um, I have a question for, for Magdala, please. Um, I, I was very interested in, in your drawing a spectrum uh, with exclusiveness at one end and inclusiveness at the other. Um, I wonder um, whether it would be possible to and if it is how you would uh, place a spectrum of depth and triviality against that mm. very difficult because people sometimes ask i mean i have encountered this in the family or casual conversations with people um you can gauge by the way they ask your question whether they really want an answer or whether they just want to confirm their own stereotype or prejudice and uh, you have to choose your answers uh, to the occasion and the context it's a, it's almost like discerning the spirit as it were you have to work out for instance i had a 10 minute taxi journey from the station to my house one day and the driver was polish and um, he had recently discovered uh, the bhagavad gita and um, so he'd clearly lapsed from his Catholicism and said he found the teaching of Krishna very wonderful and beautiful. And I said, well, can you tell me more about it? And he just said, oh, it's also beautiful. And I love the uh, love the idea of the pure soul. And um, so it was clear he had a beautiful God, not one on a cross and with all the morbidity that goes with it. And he also liked the purity of the soul and not all the messy business of the body. It was very clear quickly he was entirely serious about what he said. And I was caught and I had to say, yes, that's true. Uh, Krishna is beautiful, but he is an avatar. He comes and goes and he's a literary figure. But uh, have you ever thought of the Christian attitude to body and soul, which is involves the whole person and not one part of you? Now, by the time I tried to explain this in my own clumsy way, I had to reach my home. but. Though the occasion was, the context was him driving a car and minding the traffic and my having a kind of a, <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, but I, there is a, a convert, convert from Hindu to Christianity trying to convince a lapsed Polish Catholic that there was something in the Christian teaching, which he may need to look at, you know, that's as far as I got, instead of saying, you're wrong or sort of coming down on him like a ton of bricks, which are always to be uh, to be avoided, no matter what the temptation is. You got to take count 10 before you answer is my personal uh, uh, slogan to myself. Don't immediately reply. Wait for it. You'll be given what to say. And so once you establish some accord, and I could see his sort of attraction to a beautiful God, you know, aesthetically, he found it more appealing. And if you go further into the Krishna cult, the music, the, the, the group singing and everything, it's all very attractive. And th you have to say that for them. And, uh, and you, I mean, you may not believe in the God, but what is going on is something more than that. And uh, so I would say there is, you can't judge, not judge, you can gauge 
the level at which. And similar, but I have a talking about the Muslim marriages. We have a cousin, my husband's cousin married a Malaysian Muslim girl, and she often, her husband has become more of a Muslim than she is, in fact, you know. He reads every label for whether it's halal or har haram or halal and whatever, and before he gives his children the potato crisps. I mean, he's got very, very, not fanatic, I would say very serious, very serious. Whereas she would ask me, um, tell me about this Orthodox Christianity over a couple of, what exactly is it? And I could tell this wasn't a very serious question, meaning she wasn't really ready to listen to anything. I would have sounded an absolute idiot talking to her. So I said, well, there's a lot you can say. What do you want to know? I said, no further question came up. So there ended the conversation. You see what I mean? You can gauge. Uh, sometimes you've got to really use your common sense. And whereas the Polish uh, driver's question was perfectly serious my cousin's wives i don't think so you know and even though she was a relative and yeah <laughs> so you gauge it and then you do need short catechisms as it's where i found mm -hmm. uh, that absolutely necessary when i taught in china for three months someone stopped uh, um, someone stopped me one of the students and she, at the, after a class and said this Christmas I know about, what is this Easter thing people talk about? Oh <laughs> and you had to tell her what was Easter in about 10 minutes break. Yeah. So in other words, situations vary. And yeah. I would say, use your common sense and your guidance of the spirit to find out at what level you engage with. Indeed, indeed. But, yeah, and you can- Thank always, you very much, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, always a counter question is, a, I'm afraid, a, Good defense. <laughs> yeah, it is. thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Um, well, um, thank you very much, um, um, Philip, for your question, and and and, and Mangala for uh, the answer. I think uh, very mindful of the time. Um, I think, um, with apologies to uh, anyone who would have wanted to um, ask um, a question or, or more, uh, I think it's uh, time to draw this to a close. So um, I want to um, thank. Um, all of the participants this evening for your questions, for, for um, joining, um, for in a way making this possible as well. And, and indeed, thank you to um, Ed and to Mangala for so graciously allowing um, time to be with us this evening and to uh, deliver such stunning presentations, uh, insightful and, um, and, and thought provoking. And I think uh, helping us to, to, to get a sense, to grasp uh, better this, this topic of religious um, diversity and, and uh, interfaith dialogue. Um, Rezvan, did you want to, to say something? I think you had raised your hand. Uh, we can't hear you. <clears throat> that was me clapping for the speakers. That's oh, excellent. Clap. Oh, yes. That's the clapping the applause. Side. Yes, yes, that's wonderful. I was thinking that's actually uh, very close to the to the, to, to the hand raise uh, icon, but... Um, Thank you. Yes. Wonderful. Entirely appropriate. Entirely appropriate. Thank you. Uh, so a, 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 a genuine privilege for us to, uh, at the um, Institute for Orthodox Christian Studies, to have had um, Dr. Ed Kessler, MB, and uh, Dr. Christine Mangala-Frost um, to... Uh, um, conclude the series of uh, the conversation days this year with this wonderful, uh, with the wonderful presentations and wonderful and engaging dialogue. Um, thank you again to you all, and and hopefully this will um, not be the last time that that we we host you both. I, I know you're both very busy and engaged with various projects, um, but again, thank you very much for for being with us this evening. Um, thank you to all. Um, have have a wonderful evening, um, all of you, and uh, do keep in touch with the Institute for, for um, announcements of our next events. We have events throughout uh, the coming months, at least I think one um, every month, if not more. So uh, a very busy um, uh, summer uh, for the Institute um, looking forward. Again, thank you very much to all. God bless. <laughs>